Welcome. Welcome to our session, How to Write a Winning Speech. As I said earlier, please indicate your questions in the chat directly to me, Helen Josephine, as the moderator. Our speaker, Verity Price, went from being terrified of public speaking to being crowned the 2021 world champion of public speaking. She has published a book, Present with Power. If you want to learn to deliver like a pro, then this ebook is for you. It's a step-by-step -step guide to presenting with power, complete with tips and templates for structuring and delivering your speeches. We'll be talking about it, I think, in this presentation, but you can also visit her website, veritiprice.com, for information on how to order the book. Verity is all about facing fears, finding your voice, and sharing your truth. As the Toastmasters 2021 world champion, Verity definitely captured our hearts and our imagination with her winning speech, A Great Read, an inspiring invitation to improve our lives by writing a different story, helping people face their fears and find their voice is Verity's passion. Today, she is here to help us in our journey. Fellow Toastmasters, please welcome Verity Price, How to Write a Winning Speech. Verity, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Helen, and lovely to, to be with all of you. Thank you for choosing to be in my session. I'm excited to share this next kind of 70 minutes or so with you to delve into all things writing and delivering winning speeches. But before we get there, I do have a question, and that is who here likes winning? And just give me a sense in the chat. If you like winning, and I don't mind what it is, you know, it could be a raffle, could be the international speech contest, could be a lottery. I see some some nods, some thumbs up going up. I'm not sure if the chat works here, so we'll see. But if you like winning, I'm, I'm assuming we're all in the right place. So here we go. It's, it's coming in. So there, there's a story that I always share about winning because it is something that people seem to really, really want in their lives. And there was a story of a man who, who loved the idea of winning, but what he wanted to win was the lottery. And so like many lottery hopefuls, every Saturday night, he would watch those lucky numbers being drawn and he wouldn't win. But he'd be back the next Saturday night and he would watch those numbers being drawn and he wouldn't win. And Saturday after Saturday after Saturday, he wouldn't win the lottery. And eventually, after months of disappointment, one Saturday, after again not winning, he looked up at the sky in frustration and said, why? Why do you never let me win? And a voice came down from above and said, you might want to buy a ticket. So <laughs> I'm only here because as I shared earlier in March of 2021, I bought my ticket. I put my name in the hat of the International Speech Contest and I said yes to the roller coaster. I said yes to the hope that I might win, not to the guarantee that I was gonna win. And then I committed to the journey. And we know how that story ended, but again, like I said earlier, it only became a reality because I said yes. And it became a reality because I put my name in the hat. And the only way to win anything is to enter. That's the first step. But once you've entered, there's gonna be a lot of things you need in order to win. So out of interest, let's just put this in the chat as well. What do you think, if, if we could narrow it down to two things that you have to have to win, and let, we're gonna stick with the international speech contest. And if you wanna go all the way to the finals, become world champion, what are the two things you think you have to have in order to win and excel at a speech contest at any level? And just out of interest, it's always nice. Flexibility and persistence, I love that, a good story, perseverance, plan and execute, I love it, confidence, Keep them coming in. 
Grit, 100%. We're on spot with all of these commitment. Yep. Belief, commitment, courage, skill, a message. Yes, you do need to have a message. No speech is ever won without a message. A speech and encouragement. You've got all sorts of things coming in here. You know your why. I love that, Satisha. Why am I competing? In fact, uh, Muhammad Qatani says that, you know, when people say, I want to win. He's like, why do you want to win? You have to question that. What's your, what's your reason? Calmness. Yes, Jay, absolutely. Okay, so we've got a lot of things here that we believe you need if you want to win. But if I had to take all of this, charisma, good story, it should be gripping, sincerity, commitment, grit, all these things. If I had to take all of these and I had to put them into two things, I would say that I believe the two things you have to have if you want to win a speech contest you have to have the right mindset and you have to have the right speech or the right story. So you have to have the right mindset and you have to have the right speech. And that's what I want to talk about today, because it's not enough for me to just tell you about having the right speech, because there are many Toastmasters who enter this contest every year with a great speech, but a bad mindset. I know because I entered like that in 2012. And so if you don't have the two together, and I meet and coach a lot of people who've got the right mindset, but they don't have the right speech yet, and then we've got to get them to the right speech. And so it's about getting that mindset right and then getting the speech right. So that's what I, what I want to delve into today. And as I shared again earlier in the presentation, my mindset when it came to competing at first was arrogant. You know, I entered thinking this will be easy. I can write my speech the day before. And then my sister showed me what mindset really looks like. You know, she was terrified. She worked on her speech for a month. In fact, I felt sorry for her. She was working so hard. I was like, oh, that's so embarrassing. But she showed me, <laughs> she showed me what the right mindset can do. And then when she beat me, I instantly went into, if you're familiar with Carol Dweck's work on mindset, I went into a fixed mindset. I put a ceiling on my capabilities as a speaker and said, you know, this is too hard for me. It doesn't work for me. I'm not going to bother. I'm just going to give up. And as a result, I got no results. That's how life works when you've got a fixed mindset. So what shifted between 2012 and 2015? Because when I lost at division in 2015, that just cemented this belief that I could not win this contest. So you're 100% right, Satish. My growth mindset is what changed everything in 2020. And how I got to that growth mindset, ironically or interestingly, was through inspiration. It was watching the 2020 Virtual World Championships. I couldn't believe that they'd managed to totally pivot and take a stage competition and do it on Zoom. I was presenting professionally on Zoom that whole year, but until I saw Mike Parr and Linda Marie Miller use the screen in a whole new way, I hadn't considered what was possible with this medium. And something switched on in me. It was like a light went Oh, wow. Like, this is fun. I could play with this. This is, this is a challenge, but I could embrace this. I could really see where this takes me. And I said yes to that challenge. And I entered the contest with what I now call a champion mindset. You need to have a champion mindset if you enter this contest. And I'm just going to pull up some slides so we can, we can go through the concepts together and you can apply it to your own, to your own lives and your own speaking journeys. So, and take us through this process. So this champion mindset and developing a champion mindset is very much around how do you deal with the fact that in a contest, there are gonna be obstacles. You know, there's gonna be reasons why maybe you can't compete. There's gonna be challenges, whether it's time constraints or, you know, not finding the right speech. There's lots of reasons why we might get stopped in our journey. There's gonna be a lot of effort that you're gonna to have to put in. And unless you're prepared to embrace that effort, like my sister did in 2012, you're not going to get the results. You're also going to have to contend with feedback. And feedback, and I'll go more into this just now, was one of the hardest parts of the journey. And you're going to be able or have to be able to learn from and be inspired by others. And if you get knocked out the first year, can you learn from what others did that succeeded and come back the next year stronger? And that's what my mentor, Lance Miller, did. He took 13 years to win the world championship. He had a champion mindset. So 
The first thing for me in my journey was embracing challenges and obstacles along the way. It was lockdown. We were on Zoom. I was based, well, I'm based in Cape Town, South Africa. We have notoriously bad Wi-Fi and we have rolling power cuts. So there was a lot of reasons and a lot of obstacles between me and this title that I somehow thought I might be able to win. I had to get flexible. I figured out my parents-in-law had better Wi-Fi and they had a good uh, a generator. So I would drive across town to compete from there. I was having to compete with an 18 month old baby. And sometimes in rehearsals, he'd walk in, you know, or start banging on the door when I was in the middle of a division contest. I had to just keep going because I was committed to what I was trying to achieve. There was also the challenge, finding the right speech. And this, I think, and it just maybe in the chat, is that most people's biggest challenge when it comes to speech contests, actually finding the topic, finding the speech. Just give me a, a sense in the chat because maybe I'm the only one, but I feel like this is where most of us get a little bit caught up, that it's hard, like, what am I gonna speak about? Do I have any stories that matter? I see Jay saying, yes, it's the biggest challenge. Yes, yes, yes. So <laughs> absolutely. So this was where I had to dig deep. And as I said, my semi-final speech was coming from a talk I'd done numerous times in Toastmasters. So again, don't be scared to go look at old speeches and see if you can redo them. And I see seven minutes is the biggest challenge. Yeah, writing that short story. Um, yes, having a story file definitely helps. And that helps you overcome the challenge. If you've been keeping track of stories and things that have happened to you that you can go back and look at, you might find that story or that theme for your speech that much easier. And um, I saw someone else saying, the story's fine, it's getting to the message. I hear you on that. And I'll tell you more about that later. So this challenge of finding the right speech is often what stops people. They go, I've got nothing to speak about. And that's where sometimes brainstorming with somebody else. And I see a, a, a club member flagged it. So you're just ahead of me, Marianne. Having someone else tell you, but you always tell that story at dinner parties. It's hilarious. Why don't you do something with that? That helps you to overcome that challenge. And when I heard I was into the, the world semifinals, um, I'd already been working on potential final speeches and I took it head on. I wrote seven different speeches before I got to a great read. And that speech woke me up at three in the morning, which let me tell you is, is not a good time to be woken up by a speech. But if you commit it and you've got that champion mindset, I was treating this like the Olympics. I went and I started writing and suddenly went, oh, I think I found the speech. So are you prepared to navigate around time, family, you know, energy, obstacles and challenges and around the creative challenge and obstacle of finding the right speech. If, if you're not prepared to do that, half the battle or most of the battle is won. The, the next part that, that plays in is, are you going to put in the effort? Uh, no one has ever won this contest easily. And in fact, after I won, a little thing not many people know is when you make the finals, you get invited to a secret Facebook group. It's very exciting. And it's all the finalists and world champions and everyone gets to support each other. It's amazing. I got on there and, and once I've been world champion for a few weeks, I did a poll and I, I just asked them like how much effort went into writing your speech, getting to the finals for a lot of you winning. Because I wanted to know, was the effort I put in more, less, the same. And here's what I discovered. 65% of finalists and winners started writing their speech three months before club contest dates were announced. Okay, so they were already in it to win it. Again, 60 to 70% visited and rehearsed their speeches at more than 40 clubs and an average of 200 rehearsals. Okay, that's what came through is the average numbers. Average word count, for those of you that are interested in word count, was 110 words per minute. The lowest was 75, which is Prez Vazilev. And I think, um, I'm trying to, Danajaya was maybe 126 words a minute, but average was 110. The average amount of versions that people wrote of their speeches, 32. Now, if you remember some of the numbers I said earlier, I was completely average. 
the average amount of time they spend rehearsing in the last three months between one to four hours. So there I was more on the high end. But all I saw in all that feedback was that this contest takes effort. And we had that earlier, commitment, dedication, grit. If you can't put in that effort, you're not gonna get the results you're looking for. So the effort is palpable. And then the next part is, are you able to make friends with feedback? Are you able to challenge your speaking style, not be too attached to your story and how it's currently written and maybe change things to strengthen it, let go of an aspect that you think is crucial but the audience keeps telling you isn't? That is a big shift. And that was the hardest part of the contest journey for me was making friends with feedback. Receiving feedback from more than 200 Toastmasters and 42 clubs in 15 countries on five continents, it was overwhelming. I had to learn to disseminate between people's opinions and feedback that was actually going to move my speech forward. But when I decided to lean into feedback, to see the themes and be prepared to challenge the way I was doing things, that's when I ultimately wrote better speeches. And the last piece that is huge for developing a champion mindset, and you already have it because you're here, is are we able to learn from others? Are you, and I've got people I'm coaching now, they've already watched 25 years of winners. They're coming to me with, these are what I'm seeing are the common themes that seem to win, the threads. And I go, okay, you've got the right mindset. And this for me was reaching out to Lance Miller. I signed up for Prez Vazilev's course, amazing course on presenting. And I used them and I was hungry for knowledge, something I'd never done in previous contests. And the result that that mindset got me was the win. But the win only came because I also had the right speech. So it was incredible to win. As I was sharing earlier, it's changed my life. But the biggest thing I realized after winning this contest and realizing how many people are hungry to see if they can win this contest is that as we start the journey now with 35,000 people this year, there's only one person who's guaranteed to win. We can have 35,000 people with the champion mindset, but only one person is guaranteed to win. What excites me is that every other person that enters this contest is guaranteed to grow. And I really want you to think about that. One person is guaranteed to win a contest. And so someone said earlier, you need to know your why. You can't be just there to win. But if you're there for the growth, if you're there to stretch yourself as a speaker, to become a better speaker, to try new techniques and ways of speaking and communicating using this medium or going from this to also being able to do it on a live stage, that growth is the true gift that this contest gives people. And that was probably the biggest lesson and blessing that I walked away with after I won. I was so grateful I'd had the right mindset that I'd taken on the challenges and the obstacles. I'd put in the effort. I'd made friends with feedback. I'd learned from others. But the true gift was that that mindset and that hard work helped me grow. And yeah, lovely that I won. But as Linda Marie Miller says, you can go and buy a trophy at the $5 store, you know, but you cannot buy the growth. The growth comes from entering. So who here, just as an interest, who here is buying their ticket this year, putting their name in the hat, saying yes to the contest, giving it their best, saying yes to the growth? I just, I just want to see out of interest. Let's uh, pop it in here. I'm getting lots of yeses coming in. Yes to the growth. Buying our tickets, putting our names in the hat. Beautiful, Sarah. Sarah, are you just saying yes or are you asking a question, just checking? Is it just a yes? <laughs> Got it. Okay. I want to be on that secret Facebook group. Jay, it's moments away. Hey, just put in the work. Beautiful. Yes to the growth. Beautiful. And I and I think this is the whenever I'm coaching people for the contest, our first conversation is around yeah. the intention for competing and that being part of it to grow yeah, and to become the I'm not sure. I'm just going to mute people as they go. All right. So on the topic of gifts and uh, the gift that we get from competing and from having the right mindset is the growth that we that we gain. Um, I'm going to make an assumption, and I think it's a safe assumption, is that everyone here likes getting gifts. We like giving gifts. We like receiving gifts. It's a bit like winning. It's a stupid question. We love gifts. And uh, certainly, I my 
love language is gift giving and I go to town when it comes to wrapping and, and overthinking the presents, it's, it's a problem. But that means for me, Christmas is my favorite day of the year because there is a tree piled with presents and I can't wait to spend the morning watching everyone unwrap and see what they've gotten and look excited what someone is receiving from them. It's my best. But a few years ago, Kay, and, and the more you get to know me, you'll realize I have a wonderful brother, Murray, as well, but he lives in Johannesburg. Kay and I spend a lot of time together, and, and we always like to challenge things and challenge each other. And she said, well, we spend a lot of time in December buying presents, and we spend a lot of money. Surely, surely we can have Christmas and give gifts, but not waste time and not waste money. So I said, okay, well, let's try. And that Christmas, Christmas morning was strange because there weren't any gifts and presents under our Christmas tree. And I was like, oh, this feels so weird. But it also felt exciting because we decided we were going to have a white elephant Christmas. And if you're familiar with the, the concept of a white elephant, it's that thing that you've got that you never use. You maybe bought it one night, late night shopping on the shopping channel, and now it's at the back of a cupboard. It's at the top of the shelf. You, you haven't used it in years. It's gathering dust. So that Christmas, we asked everyone who was coming to our Christmas lunch to find one white elephant in their home, wrap it beautifully, and then we would have a secret Santa and everyone would get one gift. Well, it was hilarious. There were small presents, big presents, misshapen presents, and people couldn't wait to see what was inside. They were pulling at the ribbons and the sticky tape and the wrapping paper only to uncover like oversized coffee cups, never before used cookbooks, or my absolute favorite was a rusty, dusty hamster cage, literally from the back of someone's garage. So I think you're getting a sense. This was an interesting Christmas. But the thing that struck me was that the more someone enjoyed unwrapping their present, the more intrigued they were to know what was inside, the more they seemed to love what they got no matter what it was. I got the coffee cup and I looked at it and I said, hey, I'm going to turn this into a pot plant holder. We've got a, a bachelor friend who is notoriously single by the time the end of the year rolls by. So he always has Christmas lunch with us. And he got the cookbook and he was like, I'm going to impress my next date. And a friend who got the hamster cage looked at it looked at us and said, my daughter just said she wants a hamster. <laughs> so you're probably wondering why. Why is Verity telling us about her crazy Christmas traditions? What has this got to do with writing a winning speech? I feel like she's totally lost the plot. I will tell you why I'm telling you this story. In my 15 years of professional speaking, my 12 years as a Toastmaster, and the seven months it took me to win the World Championship of Public Speaking, the most profound thing I've come to realize is that a speech is a gift that you give to your audience. I really want you to think about this. A speech is a gift that you give to your audience. We call it presenting. I'm not sure why I never saw this before. It's got the word present in it. And when we start to think about a speech as a gift for the audience, it totally changes the way we write it, it changes the way we approach it, and it changes how we feel about it. Because, you know, people were asking me earlier those nerves before the speech contest. One of the things that helped me to ground myself was that it was a speech I wanted to give to the audience. It was something I wanted them to take home and make meaningful. And What's beautiful with a speech, as with a white elephant Christmas party, is that you right now have got hundreds of white elephant moments and memories that you've experienced in your life that are on the back of a shelf or the top of a cupboard, and they've been gathering dust and you haven't thought about them for years. And then when you sit down to work on a speech for a speech contest, Maybe something triggers and you remember that moment in a supermarket where you ran into a school friend and you felt terrible because her life was amazing and yours was awful. Or you remember that moment you were cleaning your room and you found a letter from your father and it really was a wake-up call. 
it wasn't something I thought about in years. But when I was writing that speech and I went to those white elephant moments and I dusted them off and I worked them into becoming a gift for my audience, they gifted me a winning speech. And so I wanna take you through this idea that a speech is a gift you give your audience and how to do that by unpacking the word gift or unwrapping, we'll unwrap it and uh, see where it takes us. But first, you always have a choice in how you wrap a gift. Not every gift is wrapped the same. Let's be honest, we've all received well-wrapped gifts and badly wrapped gifts. So you have choices. You could wrap your gift like this and go, there you go, happy birthday, Merry Christmas, wrap. I don't think you're that inspired right now. Or you could take all the fun out of it and actually tell them exactly what you're giving them. And uh, I'm, I'm putting this up here, my dear Toastmaster friends, because sometimes we do this as early as our title. The audience doesn't even have to listen to our speech. They already know what it's about. So if you're not going to take too much effort, rather do that. Or you could wrap it like this. You always have a choice. So my question, we'll do a quick poll in the chat. If I was giving you a gift right now, would you want the box? Let me see if you can see it with the virtual background or the bag. Bag or the box, which one do you want? It's a poll. I see the box coming through. Box, 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 box. Oh, the box is the winner. This is fabulous. The red, the box. I'm actually just gonna take my virtual background off so that it's easier for me to show you things. Okay, so the box is, is the winner. Wow. I hope the box is sustainable packaging. If you knew that this box actually has all my Christmas decorations in it that are all made of cut out paper and things I've made from the forest, it's full of sustainable uh, Christmas decorations as well. I've given away what's in the box. Don't tell anyone. All right. So why do you want the box? What is it about the box that makes you want the box? Let's put that in the chat as well. Out of interest, why the box? Intrigue, mystery, beautiful, looks pretty, curious, the heart, pretty. Okay, enticing, pretty, prettier, I love it. So it's very much, there's an appearance, the effort taken, it looks like you care about it. So these are the two, effort put into rapid, it's beautiful, it's mysterious. So we're seeing two things coming up. The way you show up as a speaker, the audience have already decided if they want to unwrap what, you, what you're there to speak about. So show up authentically, well-dressed, I've made an effort. You know, they will respond to that effort. And then it's the, we want to know what's inside. So I want to go into the three things you are wanting to create in your audience every time you speak. And as I go through this, what I've done for a little bit of fun, I, I don't have everyone's, but I've taken a few world champions speeches from over the years. And I haven't had time, I wanted to include Cyril Junior Dim, but I just have not had a, a chance to do the editing. And as I go through a concept, I'm then gonna cut to video and I'm just gonna check I've shared with sound. I'm gonna stop sharing and sharing again because you know, yeah, I did not share with sound. Let's make sure I've got that for you. I'll talk about a concept and then we'll watch how that's actually been done in winning speeches. And I hope you can take the learning that really resonates for you there. So the three things when you are writing a speech that you want to create in an audience that is going to make it a gift for them and ensure that they take your message home, which is ultimately what you're wanting to do. I call them the three C's. So the first thing you want to do is create curiosity. And the box created curiosity. You're like, what's in there? I'm interested, that's amazing. The bag didn't so much, all right. So you can create curiosity from as early as your title. And that's why, you know, it's a little bit of curiosity. We, we know it's a book, it's interesting, you should read it, but mm -mm. So look at previous world champions. Uh, Cyril Junior Dim, Indini. People are like, what does that mean? Where is this going? That sounds exotic. You're curious. Mine was a great read. Oh, I wonder, what, is it a book? Will it be good for me? I don't know. We had Mike Mon um, Mike, uh, oh, I've forgotten Mike's surname, Mike Carr. He was the librarian in Mrs. Montgomery. We've had Still Standing, the most unbelievable story, um, changed by a tire. The ultimate question, listen to these titles, they invoke curiosity. 
So look at your title and always look, how can I make the audience curious? Not confused, curious, there is a difference, but a little bit of curiosity up front is great because now they're leaning in. And then at the start of your speech, you wanna make sure that there's curiosity. You want them to be curious as to what's coming next. And so we do that by having a good pause or even putting in, you will not believe what happened next. And wait, their brain is switched on to keep listening. So really elicit curiosity in your audience by writing and structuring your story so that it keeps them interested. And, and curiosity for me is one of the, the most enjoyable things to look for in a speech. So even if we have a bland story, we start going, right, how do we build curiosity in? How do we make the audience pay attention? So I'm just going to check. I think the video is coming up next and you can see how some world champions did it. If it isn't, I'll be sharing the second C. I've, I can't see my second slide coming. So now I'm doubting which slide is coming. Do you, do you want to have a poll? Is it video or is it the second C? You guess and we'll see who's right. Let's see. No, it's the second C. You couldn't eat it. <laughs> I, I couldn't bet on myself it's there. Yummy. Right. Hello? I think someone I'm not sure I don't think that was to me all right your second thing you're wanting to create in your audience is connection if your audience does not connect to your speech if they can't see themselves in your speech they are not going to see themselves in your solution really really understand this when it comes to the stories we tell specifically if people can't see themselves in your story they're not going to see themselves in your solution and so your job as a speechwriter and as a presenter is to create connection quickly. Now, we create connection by talking about things that are universal. If we talk about failure, if we talk about hope, if we talk about disappointment, if we talk about falling in love, falling out of love, losing a job, you know, failing university, not getting into the university you wanted to, whatever it is, anything that is a universal touch point, people can connect to. And this is how we quickly cross cultures, we cross divides, and people start to see themselves in our story. It's simple, it's not complicated, but it's relatable. And in my world champion speech, I was trying to do that from early on in my speech, creating connection to life not looking the way you wanted it, to wanting the fairy tale and ending up with a scary tale. For 99% of people in the world, they'll go, I've had that happen. I can see myself, I might not have sat in a spare room eating ice cream and watching Netflix, but I relate to that. I've seen that in a movie. I can connect to the picture that you're painting. So look at the speech you're writing and go, is this connecting to everyone in my audience? That's the other challenge. I'm a woman. I was talking about wanting a fairy tale. Most men might be going, oh my word, here comes some woman talking about wanting a fairy tale. I don't connect. So as I wrote my speech, I wrote my father's story into the speech so that I could also connect to the men in the audience. They could hear about a man who'd lost his job, who'd had to start over, who'd had to create a new way of thinking about a problem he was facing. And that was how I managed the possible disconnect with my audience by making sure that there was characters, not or you're not always gonna connect to everyone, but can I bring in a relatable moment that everyone can connect to? So connection is critical. If you create curiosity and connection, that is when you will get the thing you are ultimately looking for, which is commitment. Commitment to your message, commitment to your call to action. And people will be nodding, they'll be like, oh my word, absolutely. And I know last year when I was watching the World Champions, I was when, when Cyril finished, I was like, this is me, I accept myself, I'm enough. You know, and it absolutely worked. I was curious through his speech, I was connected, and at the end of it, I was committed and utterly inspired by his message. And so that is what ultimately every speech we deliver should be moving us towards. And you can be doing this in a, in a staff meeting on a Monday. Can you make them curious about how you're gonna complete that project? Can you tell a story that they connect to and understand why their involvement matters so that when you finish speaking, they're committed to doing what they need to do? This is not just for world championship speeches. Okay, so those are your three things. 
look at the speech you're writing and, and measure yourself on this. And the commitment you're only going to be able to see when you get to the conclusion, going, actually, I think, I think I'm getting to commitment. So let's look at how this has been done by world champions. We're going to start with curiosity. And I'm hoping the sound is going to be loud enough. And, and just see, there's a few. We're going to run through a few of them. And just take note for yourself. Did these, in, and it's generally the introduction of the speech, did they elicit curiosity for you? Let's have a look. The ultimate question, that question that has plagued man since the dawn of time, and that question that each and every one of us must ask at some point in our life. Do you validate? <laughs> the steering wheel jerked. I tried to keep the car in control. That night in Chicago, a flat tire changed yeah. me. What? <laughs> you and I are not very different from this flower. Just like this flower is unique, you are unique. I was spellbound as I watched the sheriff who had just been shot slide back open that heavy metal door stagger forward a couple of steps, look deep into the camera and say, I before E except after C. I had dragged myself to the shops just to get more ice cream, thinking no one I know is going to be there. <laughs> but there she was. So here's the question and you can pop it in the chat. Did those little segments you saw elicit curiosity for you? Were you leaning in? Did you want to know where these speeches were going? Were you going, wow, I wonder, like, what's happening? I see yes with, like, extra S's, definitely, absolutely. So this is the power of curiosity. If you've got an audience leaning in, listening, you have got their rapt attention. So look at what this, your speech is going, and am I making them curious? And if I'm not, what can I do? I know that cigarette one is hysterical and, and the courage to start like that. Sometimes you've got to make a brave choice. All right. So that's curiosity. And we see it in every single, and I could have 80 world championship speeches here and we'd see it time and time again. They know how to make the audience curious early. The next one we want to look at is how they create connection. So here we're looking at how do they very quickly draw the audience into a story or a scene that they can see themselves in, that they feel connected to emotionally, or they can 100% relate to. Even if it hasn't happened to them, they're not going, I don't know what that is. They're like, yeah, I connect. I know this. This sounds familiar. This feels familiar. Let's see how world champions do that and uh, see how this resonates. I had a job I didn't like. I hadn't had a date in three years. And I had a couple of roommates named... Mom and dad. <laughs> I felt like my life was going nowhere. So I took control. I left my home and my family, and I headed to Los Angeles to start over. Six months later, I had a job I didn't like. <laughs> I was dating a girl who was trying to make me better by pointing out all of my faults. And I had a couple of roommates that made Dumb and Dumber look like Einstein and Oppenheimer. Why do flat tires always happen when you're dressed up? Open the trunk, excavated the jack, unused for centuries. I have a son who's four. And he had this bad habit of writing on the walls of crayons. And one evening I walk into his room and he's going at it, just writing and drawing and so on. And I said, hey, 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 hey. Are you stupid? 
Don't you ever do that again. And guess what happened? He did it again. Nobody likes to be threatened. Nobody likes to be intimidated. His pride would not allow it. He did it again just to spite me. A week later, I walk into his room, and again, he's going at it. And this time, he was even looking at me. Now, I wasn't afraid of the cops, but there was one person I was very afraid of, and that was my mama. Raise your hand if you have an emotional mother. Let me see. Put them all together. You get my mom. But I still had to tell my parents. When I got home, I snuck in, and I thought, if I just hide in my closet, they'll forget I exist. But then I heard from the kitchen, Mike, come in. And I walked in, and I said, Mom, Dad, there's something I have to tell you. I love you, and I... I'm scared of sheriffs. I don't know. I ran to my room. I choked. I couldn't think of anything to say. I thought, I'll tell them tomorrow. When I was a little girl, I used to love snuggling on my dad's lap while he read me fairy tales. Not surprisingly, I grew up wanting the fairy tale. All right. So can you relate, connect? to each of those scenes and scenarios? Could you see yourself in those stories where they are 100% relatable and easy for you to access as each, each one played out? Let's have a look. I see yes from Laurie. All of them. Yes, certainly. Okay, beautiful. So again, this is, this is your job in a speech. Make sure that the little scenarios and the story, and I see everyone saying yes, it just crosses divides because we all, whether we had children, we were children. And I apologize that the audio is not very loud. So my apologies on that. But we know we can connect to that. We can connect to not being able to tell our parents about something, about the fact that the, the jack in our car boot never gets, gets taken out, you know, or life not going the way you want to. So look for ways to connect with your audience through your story and simplify the story. You'll see all of those were very simple, short words, succinct sentences, but they were sincere. And that is what created the connection. All right. And that's what gets you ultimately to the commitment. And we'll get to commitment later because it's part of how we, how we tie a speech together. And so now what I want to do is go into the writing of a speech to make sure that it's a gift and the four steps that you're going to take. And I will show you examples of what has happened in previous championship speeches again, so that you can really see what I'm talking about. So let's look at the four steps and just unpack the word gift. So the G of gift stands for get clear on your message. This came through earlier. If without a message, without a powerful message, you are not going to have a powerful speech. You're certainly not going to have a winning speech. So this for me is where you ask yourself, if I had seven minutes to speak to the world, what would I say? And really be honest and do some introspection because sometimes it's not going to be that light, funny, fluffy story that you were working on. It might be something deeper. It might be something that takes you on quite a journey before you can craft that speech and really speak with all your heart. But when you're clear on that message, that why you want to stand up and speak, that's when your speech becomes incredibly impactful. A few rules around getting clear on your message. A great message statement is 10 words or less. It's a sentence. And uh, Diane Boyer says, if you can't say your message in a sentence, you're not going to be able to say it in an hour. So work on finding what Craig Valentine calls a foundational phrase. What is that easy to repeat? It's almost like the chorus of a song that two weeks after hearing your speech, someone will be able to say back. And this, and, and I think it was Alison was saying, oh, I find getting to the message much harder than just finding the story. And that was my hardest journey with my final speech. My semi-final speech was easy because my mom always used to say to me, leave the world better than you find it. I didn't have to think about that message. I really had to work on the story around it. My final speech, the story I knew, but I went through message statements like get happy, be present, 
be grateful, change the way you look at things. And it was 10 days before the finals, someone where I was practicing at a club said to me, Verity, loving your speech, but your message isn't very original. I think you're going to lose points on that. I did not want to hear that. But I went away and I phoned Kay actually. And I said, what was dad telling me? What was he, what was he really telling me? And I suddenly went, he was telling me to change my story. When I phoned Lance to do a coaching call with him, we spoke about it and he said, why don't you say write a different story? Because now there's an action to it. And suddenly my whole speech came together. The fa fairy tale analogy came in at that point. It hadn't been there. I had the idea of you, the author of your life. So sometimes the hard work to get to that message statement can transform the entire speech because it gives you a golden thread. So it needs to be an action statement. And again, we'll look at some world champions, but they go, you know, it's reach out, validate. They're very clear action statements that you're giving to the audience to apply to their own lives. Understand, I know I put it there like, just get clear on your message. This is the hard work. This is what last year and now this year with the contest, helping my clients dig deeper. What else? Really, what are we saying? And it's not always easy to get here. But let's look at how world champions bring their message into a speech. Generally, the message doesn't come from them. And a great message shouldn't come from you. You are not the guru. It comes from someone or something else that teaches you a lesson that changes you. And that's also fundamental. Find the outside force that gave that lesson to you. Now you're just sharing it to the audience, but you're not lecturing the audience on it. And ideally, when the message comes, it's not an instant transformation. And I know that because in my final speech, in the first version, I read my dad's letter, you know, and in, he was actually saying, have an attitude of gratitude. I changed it to, to strengthen the speech, to write a different story. And I was like, I read it from being severely clinically depressed. I read, have an attitude of gratitude. And in the next sentence, I was happy. I was grateful. I, everything was wonderful. And my brother-in-law heard one of the first rehearsals and he was like, that's not what happened. You took months to get better. <laughs> it's interesting that when we write a speech, we skip out the resistance, the fact that it was hard. So, um, and a, a little trick I learned from Prez Vazilev is this is where you can introduce your message to the audience numerous times in different ways. And you'll see this now when, when I show you, you'll see people receive the message and they sometimes question it or they reject it or they reflect on it before they accept it. So let's have a look at how world champions get clear on their message and how they deliver it numerous times within a speech. She took her little machine and she went, cha -ching. and then as she handed it back, she looked at me and she said, there's something special about you. I took the ticket and headed for the elevator, but I stopped. And I turned around and just said, thank you. I don't know how long it had been since I'd felt validated. Her words stayed with me all the way home. And as I was looking at my life, I started to wonder how long it had been since I validated somebody else. I wanted to do that. I wanted to make people feel good. Every person goes through life wanting to be right, wanting to be valuable. Find that. Bring it out in them. I started to discover in my life that I got what I validated. Then another voice, reach out, reach out. I can handle it. I used to believe that to reach out was weakness. I discovered my weakness was refusing to reach out. When you reach out, you attract ideas that lift you up. When you reach out, you attract solutions that lift you up. When you reach out, you attract friendships that lift you up. Words, when said and articulated in the right way, can change someone's mind. They can alter someone's belief. Words have power. Words are power. Words could be your power. You can change a life, inspire a nation, and make a 
This world a beautiful place. Montgomery put her arm around me, and she said, it's okay that you took the risk to try to fix it. The victory is not in the result. The victory is in the try. My failure had not killed me. And yours will not kill you. What was it that Mrs. Montgomery said? The victory is not in the result. The victory is in the try. Verity, your life is a book. And if you're not enjoying the read, write a different story. And then watch for a miracle. Because I'm watching too. I shout a miracle, Dad. And how? How do I write a different story about this? To prove my point? I went to Facebook. And you guessed it. There were no stories of miserable 40-year-olds living in spare rooms. But the letter just lay there. It was like it was looking at me, almost whispering, write a different story. Okay. So you start seeing a clear message is not said once. It's said numerous times in different ways. And it threads throughout the speech and very, it's very rare that it's the speaker lecturing the audience to do it. And so this is the hard work to get to that message. And then once you've got it, decide who or what is gonna introduce it. And, and often it's in the story, it's the person that shaped you or changed you or you know, the tire that taught you a lesson. And then it's how you show your hero's journey of changing and being transformed by the message. So this is the hard work, but if you get clear on your message and you have a message that's profound and that connects to the audience, that is the basis of every world champion winning speech. All right, is everyone still with me, signs of life? I know there's a lot to take in. I see Jay nodding, just checking some energy things. Okay, great. We are moving through it swiftly and I'll get you there. So our next, part the eye of the gift is to intentionally craft your story and this is the really hard work yes you've got to get your message but now how do you tell your story well and I wanted to share a little formula with you that can help in putting the pieces of your story together and making it intriguing and enticing and engaging for your audience to to listen to and it's just the word story as an anagram so that it's easy for you to remember so your first job is to create the setting. You want to transport your audience into a specific time and place so that they're instantly there. And if we looked at a lot of the speeches we've been watching up, up until now, we instantly know where we are and what we're contending with. And you want it to be visual. You want people to see something, smell something, taste something. If you've watched my world champion speech, you'll know, you know, the setting was I'm in a spare room eating ice cream, watching Netflix. There's a flavor there. There's a visual. It's very quick. It took a sentence. And my life is a scary tale. Like we kind of know the setting of my life and the time. I'm 40. Into your setting, we're always going to introduce the hero. Now, the best stories to tell are your own stories. Stories about other people uh, can be very powerful. But for this speech contest, you will see generally it's a personal experience that someone's had. So you are often the hero of your speech, but you're going to connect your audience through your weakness, not by being the all wise guru one, but actually the person who is facing an obstacle. And it could be an external obstacle or an internal obstacle. I was facing internal depression, external, everyone else was successful. And then you build that. That's where you build the tension and the humor and the delight. The audience loves the obstacle. That's what they're there for. They're there for the drama. But once you've reached the pinnacle of your obstacle, that's when you need to introduce the resolution, how you overcame the obstacles. And Lance Miller, you know, he set up, he was going nowhere, didn't have a love life, didn't have a decent job, living with his parents, took us on that journey. And then he meets the receptionist and she validates him and she gives him a gift, which becomes his message and becomes his point. And so that is always the hero's journey in any great movie, any great book, any great speech. But if you use this as your guideline, the, the bulk of your speech is going to be in the obstacle and building the tension and the humor and the characters. 
And then when that resolution comes in, you show how you applied it and how you changed and the audience will be changed with you. Again, I'm zooming through this, take a screenshot, you can come back and watch the video, but this is where most of your speech writing happens. And when you've gotten clear on your message, it becomes easier to craft this and to shorten it and to make it succinct and vivid words and descriptions, little bits of dialogue, but that you relive the story when you're sharing it, you don't retell it. If you're retelling it, it means you haven't put that emotional connection in and you're not like, and there I was, and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And then this was happening. You need to be feeling it so that your audience can feel it. I always say, if the audience can see what you saw, hear what you heard, feel what you felt in the moment in that story, that's when they are going to learn what you learned, which is going to get you to that commitment. So that's the intentional crafting of your story. I'm aware of time, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zoom through. The third part of turning an, a speech into a gift for your audience is to fill in the gaps for your audience. It's for them. So you have to go and ask for feedback to see if there's anything that's missing. And I only learned this when I was competing, getting ready for the semifinals. If I hadn't gone and practiced my speech at 42 clubs, I would never have found out the glaring gaps that I couldn't see because I was very close to my stories. I couldn't see that the audience needed more information from me or they needed less. And then I had to have the humility to listen and be prepared to change my speech. And in my semi-final speech, people were like, I love you talking about your mom's funeral and you say there was a book there, but then you don't tell us what people said in the book. I hadn't thought to do that. It involved rewriting my speech, but when I put in little paragraphs of what people had said about my mother, the speech went to another level. For my final speech, it took someone giving me feedback of going, your message is a bit boring. Can't you make it stronger? You're not exciting me. That got me to pick up your pen, write a different story. In fact, pick up your pen came from different feedback. I was just saying, write a different story. And someone in England said, I love that message statement, but you're not giving us an action. And I got off the call and I said, pick up your pen, because now it was a metaphor. So fill in the gaps for your audience. But to do that, you have to go and ask your audience what the gaps are. In the survey I did with world champions and finalists, only one person said that they had not asked for feedback from an audience and they were someone who hadn't placed. There was not one winner that hadn't made friends with feedback and filled in the gaps for their audience. So this is the hard work when you're really refining a speech. I'm not going to show the next video just in the interest of time. It's showing examples from my contest journey. So I apologize for that. But I'm going to move us on to the final step that really makes sure that your speech is a gift. And that is when you tie it all together. I believe great speeches are won and lost in the conclusions. And a great conclusion is literally tying together of all the threads of what's happened earlier in the speech. They're not saying anything new. They're not introducing new ideas. They are tying together what they've already said. And for me, a fantastic speech is when it goes all the way back to the beginning, where they started, and brings that into the concluding sentence. And uh, in my case, I actually went all the way back to my title. My closing words of my speech was, trust me, it will be a great read. But this means you start looking at your speeches as circular rather than linear. And so look at the way you're writing and going, how do I circle back to the key points, the key phrases, the key ideas, and bring that into my conclusion? So let's look at how world champions tie it all together and ultimately get commitment, because that's what we're trying to do when we write a speech. Here's a few examples of how they tie it all. This is the ultimate question. Do you validate? But this is not what's important. What's important is, can you, cha, can you, cha, can you, cha? You've been a great audience. Is there something collapsed in your life? Your knowledge may be limited. Your skills may be rusty. 
but no doubt you will be changed when you reach out. Words have power. Words are power. Words could be your power. You can change a life, inspire a nation, and make a, this world a beautiful place. Isn't that what we all wanted? Isn't that what we are all in this hall? Your mouth can spit venom, or it can mend a broken soul. Ladies and gentlemen, let that be our goal. But the people in my life were able to reach into the trash can and make me whole again. If it was up to me, I would have never been able to do it. And this is why if you have great people in your life, no matter how broke, how lost, or how broken you become, they can piece you back together. Ladies and gentlemen, when I look at you, I see something in you. But I don't know what it is. Over you. You want to lead people to fix persistent problems. Someday, somewhere, somebody is going to have to try something new. And you, as the leader, have the opportunity to encourage that effort, that effort that might fail, for a chance to find the future. The victory is in the try. Be a Montgomery leader. Encourage risk. Try new things. The victory is not in the result, my friends. The victory is in the try. Contest chair. If your life is a book, then every day you get to decide, is your story being written for you or by you? When my dad reminded me that I was the author of my life, my life changed. So if you're looking for a change, you want a new chapter, or you just fancy a miracle, pick up your pen and write a different story. Right, so I think you can see what I mean. They're tying back to their little threads. They're telling the story. They're pulling it all together. And this should be the most exciting part of your writing process, that you write your story, you work on your story, you get clear on your message, and then you, you draft that conclusion to tie it all together and to complete the circle. So that, my friends, is how you write a winning speech. Um, it's getting clear on your message, intentionally crafting your stories, filling in the gaps for your audience, tying it all together, and along that journey, keeping them curious, connected, and finally committed, and truly giving them the gift of the message that you have wrapped, that white elephant story that you've maybe put together in a beautiful way so that they could get to the life-changing message. And if you take that approach to writing with a champion mindset, I can promise you growth. I can't guarantee you a win, but I can promise you, you will write stories that win over your audience and stories that will make you grow as a speaker and as a presenter. So I'm over to you for questions. I know I've given you a lot to contend with. So let's uh, have a listen to what it is that I can help you with. And if you need help online, please go check out what I'm offering on my website. But more importantly, how can I help you now? Thank you so much, Verity. It was a wonderful speech and such great tips for us today. Please put your questions for Verity in the chat directly to me, moderator Helen Josephine, and I will ask Verity those questions. <clears throat> I really liked your keeping it simple, the arc of the story in those three points and the examples from the speeches to really cement those ideas in our minds. I'm going to look at the chat to see. I think there are a couple of questions that have come in already. And one question is 
uh, you mentioned the survey that you did of uh, from the Facebook group, mm. wondering about the word limit for a winning speech. You said yours was kind of average, but uh, is there other information you could give us about that word limit question that you would ask? I would, yeah. So you want to sit between 100 to 110 words per minute. That is a good rule of thumb. I was on about 110, 115. Bearing in mind, if you're competing virtually, I didn't have to worry about an audience laughing or waiting for audience reaction. So if you intending to be on stage, rather err on the side of writing a six minute speech and going to six and a half than writing a seven and a half minute speech, because then you're going to get disqualified. And, and where word count matters is when you take it seriously, it means you really look at, and I, I took trying to paint the picture of my life at 40, I wrote various things and nothing was working. And then I had this analogy of fairy tale and suddenly I went, oh, for my ego, that was a scary tale. Job done, cut my word count, say it in an interesting way, grab the audience's attention, but simple. So work on 100 to 110 words a minute and be ruthless. You've got to kill your darling sometimes when you're editing a speech. I, I think each word is so important as you point out, finding that word, that the word itself can paint a picture, as you said, a yeah. scary story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then that allows you also to add pauses. To yes. And get, you want get the you audience want pauses. to, right, get the audience to absorb that. Mm -hmm. So, so that's excellent. Um, another question was, how did you choose the 40 plus clubs that you practiced with? Did you just go, I want a totally different audience or did you have a, a in mind a type of audience, a more professional audience or a more specialty club or what happened? I know I just wanted audiences from around the world. So I wanted diversity. So I went from India to Bahrain, to London, to New Zealand, to the US. And uh, how I did it was I got a breakdown of all the districts in the world. I took all the semifinal districts and said, well, I can't go and you know, practice there because their semifinalist needs the opportunity to. And then I looked at districts that fell into a good time zone for me. It took me until two weeks before the end to go, oh my word, I could have been practicing at clubs you know, in New York, wherever, where it's maybe two o'clock in the afternoon for me. It's not cutting into my evening. So I was a bit slow on that. I worked out that actually East Coast America and um, Australia were very good time zones for me. So look at your schedule, look at where it's going to work for you, and then look at the world clock and then go onto the Toastmasters website. I would look in that city and then I just emailed clubs and said, this is what I'm doing. Will you have me? People were amazing. They put on special events for me. They got all their district past evaluations winners to come and do feedback. It's incredible the support you get if you ask. Yes. Yes. That's fabulous. That's that asking. Yeah. <laughs> Another question. How do you keep the freshness of your speech? If you've been practicing it over and over and giving it, how do you make it still like you said it for the first time? So that is challenging. And that's why often you do end up, well, I ended up rewriting little bits every now and then to make it fresh. It started sounding very boring to me. Sometimes I'd do four clubs in a day and I was like, oh, the speech is terrible. And I was questioning myself. So what I do with that is I will go deliver it somewhere else. I'll go for a walk. I'll speak it out. I will wrap it. I will sing it. I will um, do it like I'm a little child and I'm just going to go through my script and I'm going to do it like this just to get through the words. And I would do silly accents and I would like do it like I was really tired and I was trying to. So I, I did that to keep it fresh. So don't keep delivering it like you're trying to win with it. Play with it. And that will also help you stumble onto bits of body language that you haven't thought of before. Or So get away from the seriousness of it. And, and play with it. And that, that helped keep it fresh. Well, speaking of body language, there's a question about the current online format that all of our clubs are in mostly, and certainly the contests. How do you write a speech for that just waste up delivery and still include the body language? 
So body language for me is not uh, amateur dramatics acting. So I think sometimes we get we get confused. And and even sitting here from the waist up, this is body language. I'm talking to you, and I'm I'm really excited about what I'm talking about, or I'm looking over there just describing something. We're th- I'm painting a picture with my body. It doesn't need to be this. And now I'm going to stand on this side of the screen, and then I'm going to become this person, and that becomes messy. Speak like you would to a friend over a cup of coffee, but it's something you're excited about and you're reliving that moment. Your your body will speak with you. And then you can bring the intentionality that we need for contests of setting up, you know, I was like, everything that's not working was, um, was over here and everything that was working was over here. And, you know, I could, my dad was knocking door to door And he'd gone from a corner office to selling insurance. I made those decisions, but I was was standing, but it was waist up. I was communicating to my audience. I didn't feel limited by that. And I I don't think we should let that hem us in. You can still communicate. Just your face can say so much if you let your eyes be part of the story. (laughs) Most, Most assuredly. That's very good advice. I think this will be our final question. If you were starting anew as a Toastmaster, what would you do differently in your path that you've taken? Oh, that is a very, very good question. You know what's funny in life is I always look back, even if it's been hard, and I go, well, I wouldn't do anything differently because I wouldn't be where I am right now. And and I would hate to have missed this experience because I, I would have had a different experience. So I don't know that I would have done anything differently. The only thing I can answer honestly is in my leadership journey, I sometimes when I had a team didn't delegate correctly. And because I didn't want to have a hard conversation, I would end up doing someone's job for them rather than having the difficult conversation. So that's the only thing that I'm constantly working on as a a person. But the rest of Toastmasters I'm glad I waited six years not to compete and that I saw how limiting my mind was. And I had to, I had to go through that journey. So I, I'm just grateful for all of it. And I will continue to remember not to rescue people and rather have difficult conversations if I need something to change. Oh, great. Thanks so much. Could you share a little bit about your book before we close? Uh, Uh, 100% so this is a book I actually wrote before I was world champion I've been teaching my presenter power course for the last eight years and it's inspired by I can be very honest it's inspired by the competent communicator manual which I saw help my sister get to the world semifinals and building on my experience as a TEDx speaker a professional speaker so it really is to break speaking down into the nuts and bolts. This is how you structure it, you know, great conclusion, great introduction to do the body. This is how you get to your message, bring in humor, body language, how to bring in uh, gestures and connection to audience. So it's a step-by-step book. Every chapter has a template. So you can use the template to go and assess your speeches and make sure you're ticking all the boxes. And it's very much aligned with what judges would be looking for in a speech contest. So it's my little passion project and I'm always grateful if it helps people write a better speech. Thank you so much. We're gonna be whisked away out of the breakout room, but we wanna say again to you, Verity, thank you for sharing yourself so much with us today and your stories. Thank Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of your training and thank you so much for the beautiful warm welcome. Yes, we'll be checking out your book for sure. So I've gone to (laughs) veritypriceprice.com to get a copy for myself. Oh, well, thank you. (laughs) Thank you. Bye, everyone. Have a beautiful day.